All right, we are recording. Okay, so one can never be too prepared. And uh, I've seen that um, in expression from a friend who moved out from Wisconsin recently, and they went into complete panic with these fires with all the smoke. Whereas the people in our Western Hills Fire Safe Council, um, with all the red light, red flag warnings, they know to have gas in their cars, their cars parked facing out. Um, we're working on home hardening from the inside out. So first you do your home and then you do your landscape, five feet, 30 feet, 100 feet. And so there is a level of calm in the midst of these fires passing through when we know we have got some protection measures. And of course, uh, when we're told to evacuate, it's time to evacuate. Um, and also uh, have an air purifier or more than one. Uh, given the last 32 days or 31 days in Sebastopol. An air purifier is really important and it's gonna happen again. It was also 109, 110 degrees in Sebastopol. No one has air conditioners here. I might get a little room air conditioner because with climate change, that's gonna be important. Um, I'll let others speak to salvage logging um, and the value of salvage logging. Uh, so I think I've done my three, thank you. Penny, would you like to proceed? Yeah, so um, I, I think the top lesson I've learned is um, is about how everything's going to change, you know, that, that things change. It's sort of a simultaneous feeling of like um, being able to relax into that, seeing, um, seeing how the landscapes in some places that have burned have recovered um, and uh, feeling hopeful about that um, and so it's been more of like a, a big in interior lesson about change um, but then just this past um, this past episode with the big fires and the smoke I also have a, a deep feeling of like um, we don't really it's hard for us to even imagine what we're in for. Um, and I started to read some literature about climate anxiety. Um, and I came across this term uh, called solastasia, I think it is. And it's a term that a guy, Glenn Albrecht in Australia coined to talk about um, that um, being homesick for your home while you're there. You're at home, but your home has changed in such a way that it's become distressing in your own place. And it just feels like that kind of, that, that helped me actually to be able to understand more of the sort of anxiety that I've been feeling and that people around me have been feeling too. Um, so I've just been writing a, a uh, article for our newsletter that's coming out in a couple of weeks and I was trying to like just sort of acknowledge where we're at right now and what we need to be doing going forward and uh, just have so much appreciation for like the learning curve that we've all been engaged in, especially this group um, and all of the things that we have put in place, all of the ad adaptations that we've put in place um, and how still, when I think of it from the perspective of Friends of the Mark West Watershed, the work is still relational. You know, it's still about like, how well do we know our neighbors? How partnered are we with them? Um, and how confident are we in all our different systems that we're putting in place? Because it just seems like the intensity of these events is getting ramped up along with, I think this is another big learning, that all of our like amazing systems and response abilities are just getting overwhelmed. And so that we've got to really be more, even more like interconnected with our neighbors and more able to understand the signals that we're, we're getting from all of our, <laughs> you know, we've got so much more data coming um, at our fingertips now, but how we interpret it is still um, a learning field um, that I think we're, we're figuring out 
together. It feels like a culture that we're creating. Um, so anyways, that's some of the stuff that's been roaming around in my head. I'm really so grateful that we're having this conversation today because it, it feels like we're at, at the threshold of like a new level of the climate, climate crisis. Um, so I think it's super important that we're talking about this and thinking about some of the help that um, that I know here at Women's Real, we've gotten um, access to two grants through NRCS, um, which was really surprising that they actually had funding available for us so we can continue doing forest thinning work. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think um, what could be useful for more landowners is actually if we could maybe together we could create some kind of a survey because I feel like I'm I'm a little bit blind about what people are needing right now um, from the larger watershed. So I think a survey would be a really good idea and be helpful if uh, some people would be willing to work on that together, see what kind of information would be most useful for us. Um, maybe a grant writing um, collaborative because we put a lot of work um, in the, the new fire safe council into writing a um, a complicated grant for cal fire that was you know you guys know it we didn't get it so that was a little distressing but i'm wondering how we could use that to learn how to do it better um, and how we could do it in a way that's not in competition with each other um, and um, this idea of being able to do long-term management on the property doing grazing collaboratives or that sort of thing i don't know how to get that happening but it just feels like we've got the pieces in our community um, it's really expensive for private landowners to try to bring um, grazing herds on the property so some kind of collaborative to do that would be great that's that's what i got right now thanks that's great thank you very much penny I have D and then uh, 2936628. Does anybody recognize that phone number? We'll find out, won't we? <laughs> right. Hopefully. It, 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 it's me. This is Jim. And just Hi, so I'm just but, but I'm you. You know. Great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, you'll be after D, okay? Okay. Well, I. Uh, I am so grateful that you all are talking to each other. So I want to take a moment to have us all be appreciative uh, about what we all sense is so important to share our truths with each other so that we can combine them and move them forward faster and broader. So I just, um, each of you have such, um, you have my gratitude, that's all I can say. And you all know it, but sometimes we don't say it. <laughs> and so I needed to say that. Um, so I'll go on. So uh, the other suggestion I have um, um, is, that we should host a meeting having communities that have done or are planning forest thinning or other treatment types like uh, Penny just suggested, like Jean is doing, like Judy is doing, like lots of people are doing, uh, people I don't even, uh, groups I don't even know what they're doing, to bring those messages to the, uh, the group so we can learn from them and uh, understand, you know, what, better how to um, make forest treatments uh, more uh, more broad. Also, I would just say I want to comment on my first um, comment on the chat is, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about what should be done or not done uh, to um, return and help our forest from doing absolutely nothing, as you know, to the, the timber people who are cutting, you know, beyond anybody's understanding, because that's not the right practice either. So 
I really don't want to have people and groups be uh, at odds about this, but rather, again, sort of the same type of conversation with those that are doing treatments, um, have these different opinions um, discussed and better understood. And I'll give an example and then I'll close. Um, there's a conversation going on now about some THPs and after the fires, what do you do? And um, there's just so much division and we don't have time for that. We simply do not have time for division. We have time for learning, collaboration and cooperation. So bring them in, bring them on. And no one else is doing that. I, I you know, the, the work that we're doing and the work that the Taking Action for Living Systems is doing, which is an outcropping of this group, um, is totally un misunderstood. But yet we haven't had the bandwidth to share our opinion of what are we really talking about when we talk about forest thinning or prescribed burning or all the things that we know need to be done. Studying biomass, well, what does work if it's not working now? We have to find a way to utilize the material that we need to have removed from our forests. Or do we need to remove it? You know, I mean, there's maybe, I don't think, I have opinions, but we need to discuss them. So those are my two um, ideas. Okay, thank you very much, Dee. Um, Jill, would you like to follow? And then Peter, you're after Jill. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm not very well prepared. Um, and I think I'm still processing a lot of what's going on. Um, I guess just um, in real general terms, I think Sonoma County has made enormous progress on, on the whole issue of uh, fire safety and fire preparedness and fuels reduction. Um, you know, there's, and, and we need to continue to, to ramp up um because because the threats seem to be ramping up um uh, and i'm sorry this is going to be so disjointed uh um i guess uh, the other thing is we um we we probably all should shouldn't have been maybe as shocked as we are that uh, a record-breaking fire season has followed a record-breaking um, dry spring. Uh, so we did kind of have some some hints. And, and I think uh, our local fire chiefs, um, um, like Marshall Turbeville, um, were on top of that. And, you know, th thank God we, we've had them on our, our side. Things certainly could have been even worse. Um, I guess I sort of want to close, you know, just in terms of what um, I, I'm, I'm sort of mulling over uh, that in, in general, I haven't gotten to get out and, and see any of the, the burn areas yet, but past fires that I have seen, generally the fires are not environmental disasters. Um, they're there are a lot bigger um, social issues and, uh, you know, the whole community rebuilding um, economic toll. Um, and that that's sort of what I'm noodling around on. I, I think we need to ramp up a lot more on the kind of um, issues Carol Leone's been talking to us about for years about uh, structure hardening. And, and building with the expectation that our homes will be exposed to fire and what does it take for them them to survive. Um, okay, and that's, <laughs> that's about all I have to offer. I know there's so much more in there, Jill, that you'd like to share, but thank you for keeping it nice and concise. Um, uh, Peter, would you like to continue? Uh, am I unmuted? 
Hello? Yes, you're fine. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, I'd like to say, first of all, it's the first time I've seen Adriana without a mask and a fire helmet. I met her last June at a wonderful burn down near uh, Sonoma. Um, my family comes at fire uh, through a very lengthy history. My grandmother, Mary Lee Hess, bought our 80 acres for $15 an acre in 1939 in Cobb. And I have regretted that she didn't buy it in the Russian River Canyon until this summer because we lost our first home in 1962 in the Widow Creek Fire. And then we lost our second and third homes in the Valley Fire in 2015. And I thought we were finished with fire until October 8th when my sister nearly lost her life, I phoned her at the last minute saying there's a little, there's a tiny fire near Tubbs Lane and she and her boyfriend got out of our family home just in time. So um, we've lost four homes to three wildfires in 50 years. And um, at Cobb, we are, we've just passed our fifth anniversary of the Valley Fire. We're five years down the road into um, developing a wonderful network of fire resilience, timber harvest, um, and, and all the things that go with what you've been talking about, uh, what Dee has been mentioning, um, uh, and, you know, about fire hardening homes and so forth. So I've actually started lecturing. Um, I do lectures on, on fire resilience, and my older son, Michael, uh, graduated from UCLA in cognitive science and then decided to become a wildland firefighter, so he's, he works for South Lake County. Um, at Cobb, we have a lot of resources that we would be wonderfully, we'd be thrilled to share. Um, we did a timber harvest on our 80 acres to move our burned timber, but lots, lots of the issues in, in Cobb uh, may be paralleled in Sonoma County. We've got a lot of elderly um, people living on lots, half an acre lot, um, and then we've got a few people owning lots of land, and so we've had to do uh, some creative work about how to integrate the needs and concerns and skill levels of all sorts of people. And we have our, um, um, we have a brand new Lake County Prescribed Burning Association that I will be happy to start burning with. Um, Mike Jones says we can do it as soon as COVID lifts, but we'll find, <clears throat> we'll find ways to do it. So I think there's a tremendous uh, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done, but also a lot of resources that we can share. And I really look forward to to helping share those. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. I have uh, Brianna uh, and then Ellie, please. Hi, everyone. So I'm Brianna Boaz. I'm the new Natural Resources Management faculty at Santa Rosa Junior College, uh, replacing the lovely Casey Wade. Hello again. Um, so I am very new to Sonoma County. I'm about two months in. So, so far, my only real fire experience has been the Wallbridge fire, which was not a pleasant experience. Um, I live in Guerneville. We do not have a defensible space to speak of. Um, and when there were those epic lightning strikes, I did have the foresight to get renter's insurance, which does cover wildfire. So that was probably the biggest lesson I learned. Uh, definitely get renter's insurance if you don't own. And I think one of the biggest insights is how little I actually knew that when the Wallbridge fire, which hadn't even been named yet, was expanding and it was getting smokier, I still didn't think it would come our way. And it almost threw me off guard when all of the um, emergency vehicles started coming by yelling, you know, evacuate now. So I think I was really taken off guard and unprepared. So the biggest lesson, renter's insurance and the fire can come to you. So be, be prepared and mindful of it. Um, but that's so far my only experience. Thank you very much, Brianna. We're looking forward to having you aboard and working with the JC again. So we really appreciate your input. Uh, Ellie, would you like to continue, please? Yeah, hi. Um, I, you know, I'm fairly new to this group. I just got involved in February and I, I'm still trying to figure out who, who is with what 
organization. So maybe the, the as we keep on going, we can actually say like who we're representing. So I'm I'm with the Ecology Center and um, along with UC Master Gardeners and the Habitat Carter Project, we developed a, a group called the Resilient Landscapes Coalition. And um, but but what I want to say about um, what I've learned in the last four years is that um, our landscape really is changing uh, and, it, and it feels overwhelming. And not just how much the landscape is changing, but the amount of information that's out there that's sometimes conflicting about what to do about it. And people have already kind of mentioned that a little bit. Um, and I've also discovered personally how deeply I care about the land and the earth and biodiversity. And um, I mean, it's actually really astonished me how this has really hit me in the, in the way of, you know, what is happening to the land, what is happening to our um, plant communities, the wildlife, I mean, of course the people, right? But that's, that goes without saying. Um, and then I've, there's also, I've been enlightened about what's um, the result of people moving into the, creating the wildland urban interface, you know, just how much has changed since the 60s and what a huge impact that has on our reaction to fire. Um, and of course, you know, we've suppressed it so much anyway, but, um, you know, so this climate change plus this moving into the wildland urban interface has been just an extraordinary, um, you know, created extraordinary problems. And then in, in terms of what to do about it, because I feel so passionate, you know, that something needs to be done, um, that, that we do have tools, you know, and, and that's why we developed this Resilient Landscapes Coalition, is to, to try to reach out to landowners who, um, you know, who don't really quite get that they need to do something. I mean, I'm amazed when I go around and I look at how much people aren't doing anything about defensible space. And sometimes I think it's just because they can't visualize exactly, you know, they don't actually feel fully impacted. And I think there's this denial because of the overwhelm. But, um, but one of the things that I've realized is that when we, and this is slightly different, but when we train people the, either the landowners or the assessors about, and, and the people doing vegetation management is, this is back to what Dee says, we do have to help people understand the impacts we're having on biodiversity and habitat when we go out and do the clearings. And, and even when we do our defensible space, and they're great opportunities if we provide the right education to all the people who are involved, because there's this huge push now, and, and everybody's you know even panicking that, when we do it, we need to do it in a way that supports habitat and creates resilient landscapes and supports biodiversity. So, and I and I'm and I'm really like all in, and I want to help and I want to collaborate with people. And I've been working with Roberta McIntyre, who you know at FireSafe Sonoma, who's totally you know supportive of this idea. But I'm still trying to figure out how to do it. You know what the coalitions are. So, I'll leave with that. All right, thank you very much, Ellie. Um, and I, I have Anne and uh, Fred on my screen next. All right, are you able to see me and hear me? Yes, you're doing good, thanks. Okay, good. Um, so I'm Anne Creelock with Sonoma Water. Um, I've been a little absent the last, I don't know, a while now. Um, uh, parenting um, and homeschooling and work and all of that um, has been interesting, an interesting journey. Um, but I'm happy to see you all today. Um, a few of the lessons learned, um, you know, one of the things we're doing at Sonoma is working on a climate adaptation plan. And it feels like, um, you know, all the things that scientists were predicting years ago are happening so rapidly and everything is accelerating so rapidly, it feels a little overwhelming. Um, you know, the things that we were talking about just a few years ago uh, in this context felt a little fringy back then and now it feels extremely relevant and mainstream. So uh, the whole kind of context for that conversation is changing. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, the vegetation management, forest management piece of this is still extremely important. 
Um, I think that home hardening, defensible space, roadside fuel management probably needs to happen just everywhere. Um, and then the forest management, because we're so tight on resources, needs to happen in really strategic locations so that we're uh, slowing things down um, as fires, future fires move towards communities and, and resources like our water supply. Um, to follow up on what Penny was talking about, that CAL FIRE grant that um, uh, your community, Penny, applied for and then um, you weren't able to get and we received some funding. Um, that funding went to Northern Sonoma County um, Fire District and um, some other partners. And um, parts, so that project, among other things, included roadside um, fuel work, some defensible space work at residents, particularly vulnerable residents, kind of elderly, disabled, uh, those folks, um, and some other things. And some of those areas actually burned in the Wallbridge fire. And we saw that, um, well, for Kincaid, the roadside fuel management um, that had happened under a similar grant really stopped the fire, and those were the containment lines. But um, in this area, it helped and it helped with ingress and egress, but didn't necessarily stop the fire in places where there was a crown fire moving across the road. So that's interesting. One of the residences where we did that work um, had fire right up to the edges of, of the defensible space and the home was saved. So that was a really neat um, demonstration of how effective that work can be. So that's super exciting. I actually want to get out to that property and, and check it out in the near future. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is um, that it takes a village. We need to meet and get to know each other from the neighborhood level, getting to know your neighbors and figuring out what you can do together to work at scale, to the agencies, getting to know you know, the planners, the fire, the water people, the everybody else who has expertise outside of your, your, your own expertise, because no one agency has all the expertise in house to do what needs to get done. So groups like this are super important and um, super grateful to be part of this conversation today and, and hear what you all have to say. Great. Thanks very much, Ian. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, Fred, and then Wendy Smith, please. Okay, this is Fred here. Um, let's see. Are you seeing me? Yes, you're good. Am I good? I might want to share screen here because um, I was prepared to do a little bit of a presentation on what happened. Uh, I have a lot to share. My land got basically burned entirely. Um, and if I could take a couple minutes with that, would that be okay? We that sounds good. I think everybody really appreciate that, Fred. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to flap through a few slides here to show you what happened and what it looks like right now and show you okay. what we were doing, um, in, in the fire or it says 40 there, but don't be, don't be too intimidated. Um, really, I was going to be talking last, the last couple of weeks, uh, months, about forest improvement and how I know what's going on uh, and all these things I've learned as a forester over the last 40 years. But this is the irony edition because it turns out that everything one knows may well be wrong. We always had these visions of fuel breaks and vegetation management and choosing the trees that we wanted to grow and how we knew what was going on. And uh, so we had a metrics of success like separation of canopy and redu reduction of fuel ladder and really producing the forest. So here's a piece of 400 acres and we have done everything on this. We've logged it twice. Uh, it was regrowing in 1960. Remember forest management is a part of it. Logged in 1890, logged in 1960, replanted. Um, Here's thinned and planted. We, we even planted this in 1981 and then regrew and we've been 
uh, doing thinning in here and had a lot of material on the ground. We were assuming it was over here. We were assuming it was going to decompose. Well, the material on the ground for the last 40 years did not decompose. Um, we changed the vegetation height. Here's uh, our land versus somebody else's land. These are great things. And I got a big shout out to Sonoma County GIS. Shout out to Kim for getting the information to us. Shout out to everybody who puts our beautiful systems together. Here's our fuel ladders. Again, at the boundary of the land, you can see that we have fuel ladders that are basically it looks great. It's all spotty and, and stuff, but here it's all dense in the one to four meter category. Then there was the fire, right? And we're looking at the fire coming through and I've got some uh, air photos coming up of this area over here. My land was located in here and this is Mill Creek coming up and there's Healdsburg. We're five miles west. Um, Sentinel is, and Copernic Copernicus has um, some satellite bands on it called Sentinel 1, 2, and 3, and they're really good at getting this material. You can actually pick it up on uh, ArcGIS from, from your desktop. So by the end of the, uh, a few days later, we saw that the smoke had cleared, and this is what the land looked like. And, and yes, green is trees. White is ash. This is a real photo. Next door, they put in vineyards, and it turns out those vineyards saved the house. And they had a bulldozer there working, expanding the vineyard area. And uh, the house, there's a big old house up, up here. Anyway, uh, so that actually helped out. Also, the fire kind of petered out right in here at the bottom of the Mill Creek draw drainage. And that's the fire intensity. Uh, taken during the fire. I, Mark Moreno, I believe, put this together. Somebody may know who it is. It's a beautiful map. I'll give you that. I just don't like the information on it. We've always believed that separating the crowns would do something effective. Before, after. Every one of those trees got fried. We don't even have leaves on them right now. If they are going to re-sprout, they're going to look like pipe cleaners. They will not be efficient production areas. I was gonna show this off and say, look how great my shaded fuel break is. We have, uh, according to presidential guidelines, picked up every stick within 100 feet of the road and burned it separately uh, or chopped into firewood. That's what this area looks like now. Um, the truck was moved actually between the two pictures. I took the truck out and put it back in. Um, and see all these, these leaves, they're all fried. It wasn't so much a canopy fire, which would have burned it, but rather a ground fire that came up with superheated air and the superheated air. I do not have my pictures of, of leaves blowing mercifully in this um, slideshow. But all of these leaves have an orientation and you can see where the fire was coming from because they point at the fire. And this is what it looked like on the ground before. See how clean that is? That's what it looks like now. Um, that is the soil burning, okay? Uh, I have some stuff in here from your neighborhood, Caroleone. Um, this is, uh, uh, what is it? The, not big barn, um, the fern field. Mm -hmm. And this is looking downhill at the road from the fern field. And I was scared then. So we were thinking, oh, if you get a lot of separation and just have the, the stuff on the ground, it might be okay. Under conditions like that, that's not going to be okay. This might be okay. This is pepperwood. Where, they, where it did get burned through, and actually this was before the burn, but it was able to recover uh, as bags, the, as oaks. The oaks seem to be able to handle this. The, the conifers, not so much. The conifers that we planted, not so much. Um, that's just pepperwood. That's what 6,000 trees per acre looks like. Uh, that's another story here of how to thin it but that's pepperwood. 
Um, this is uh, doing some, some pre-treatment burns. Actually, this picture was taken at our place. We were being artistic, holding firewood. That's what this place looks like now. Um, we're, I would love to look at other issues, like how do you mulch slash into the ground? Will that work in the future? Well, um, maybe not so much. So the other things I wanted to say is we've been thinning out these trees and you can see in here, you, you thin it out and you've got these clumps. After a fire, it looks exactly like this. You still have thinned it out, but those clumps have just turned into fire hot spots. Uh, we thought we were doing well, but it turns out not so much. So we took care of the tan oak, um, but we seem to have taken care of every other tree on the property. So I don't know what our goals here are anymore, but now we're down to literal charcoal on the trees, having cooked them through. Uh, it looks like redwood bark, but it was charcoal. And the madrones, they look red again, but it's the bark peeling off of them wholesale. So I think all, both of these trees, this is a redwood, this is a madrone, I think they're fully dead at this point. So we're going for salvage. Um, it's, you know, I wanted to end on a really hot, high note and say, uh, we all, all have to design our landscapes, but sometimes our landscapes get designed for us. And you'll see that I have a, familiar quote up on the top. <laughs> so uh, that's what I've got to say about the fire, which is everything we know is probably wrong. And um, it looks like we're just going to have to go to a different kind of landscape if we're going to have fires that burn at this time of year. And that the concept of leaving the slash on the ground is probably a problem um, unless it is burned during the winter. Burn this, you have a much better chance of getting through this. And so at the end, I'd say um, burn, burn, burn. Uh, cannot have enough controlled burns to do this right. And um, be ready for changed vegetation. Be ready to have a fire adapted landscape. Thanks for letting me go. Okay, thank you very much for sharing that. I think that's a huge, uh, valuable lesson for us. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking also to know how much uh, sweat and tears you put into that property uh, to see the results that weren't quite meeting your expectations or any of our expectations, so. Well, um, I do need to say, Kim, I'm not heartbroken. I am yeah. I'm sad. But uh, as, as we teach in all the classes, if you're counting on your trees to pull you through your forest management, you're making a mistake. So we also have um, things like a, a cell tower uh, going in and, and the road access for somebody else. So, you know, maybe this is gonna work out fine. I also have, um, I hate to say this to the Sierra Club folks listening, but I have the salvage and there is value in that. So, <clears throat> I'm going to salvage the, the land because I've been growing these big trees for 40 years now. Uh, right. That's the only way I can recoup any of this, you know, besides the cell tower and the road. Yeah. Right. Kim? I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. but Fred, I mean, um, Arthur seemed to think he has something very um, cogent to have come right now after Fred. I saw that. Thank you, Dee. Um, I guess we'll give Arthur a pass on this one. <laughs> Well, thanks. Um, and Fred, my heart really goes out to you. I mean, that, you know, I, I never got a chance to get out to your land when it was, you know, the way it was the minute before times. So um, I, I'm sad for myself that I didn't get to see it other than your photographs. Um, I want to talk about something else just for a minute first, and then I'll go into the thing that more directly relates to what Fred's situation um uh, you know basically i agree with what everybody has been saying i mean all that stuff's been running around in my own head and the the one piece that i wanted to bring up that i haven't particularly heard mentioned i mean it, people have talked about the sense of overwhelm which i certainly feel and um i remember when we were talking to our contractor for our rebuild he's a former fire chief and he was talking about how 
overwhelming 2017 was for many firefighters because they couldn't, you know, do what they were trained to do, which is to save, you know, save people, but also save structures. And they, you know, it was just too overwhelming. They couldn't, they couldn't, they had to decide what to save and what not to save. Um, and he, and he was talking about the, you know, the mental health issues that people, that firefighters were facing at that time. Um, and I've been feeling like, um, you know, trying to keep a sense of some optimism has been more difficult in the last couple of weeks, especially. Um, and um, so I think that's something since these fires, as people say that, you know, the, the environment, you know, will uh, restore itself in some way or another. Um, but the resilience of people is, is a key part of it. Um, both just the physical structures, but also our mental health, I think is, is a, you know, we have to keep, we have to keep some kind of optimism to be able to keep going. And uh, so I've, I've been trying to cultivate some sense of hope um, out of this. And uh, I guess the one other little thing I wanted to mention before I go into to my response to Fred directly is that, um, you know, the night of the 2017 fires, um, you know, I had about 15 minutes to pack up, um, you know, and, and in retrospect is like, well, I did it. I made pretty good decisions in a, in a hurry. I wasn't quite in a panic, but I made pretty good decisions in a hurry but what i see afterwards is that that people want to fix things totally understandable and and a, a, a you know generally that's a real positive thing but i think there's this rush to, to do something to fix things and i think that can backfire and you know like d was talking about you know allowing logging companies to go out and just you know tear down forest because it's called fuel reduction miles away from you know any population center so I, I'm not sure what I'm exactly what I'm saying, but I think just to try to be recognize that desire to fix things and also try to be patient because uh, this is a it's a long term thing. Um, so then, um, as far as what I wanted to say for Fred, I'm going to share my screen and thanks for indulging me with having uh, two of the Hollywood squares because my uh, my desktop uh, doesn't have a camera on it yet, so I'm using my tablet for that. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, is that coming up? Uh, let's see. I'm hoping this is coming up. Oh wait, here we go. There we go. Is that is that showing up on one of my screen? There you go. Now you're good. Okay, you guys are seeing a map or? Uh... Yes, that's good. Thanks, Arthur. Okay, I, for some reason I can't see the map on my desktop computer, but if you guys can see the map. Um, so this was the result of the, this is the very first preliminary, I'm gonna make this a little bigger, um, preliminary results from the CAL FIRE work I'm doing right now, which is uh, looking at, um, you know, long-term sets of, uh, uh, vegetation data and sorry I'm just trying to get this just the right size here okay um, so uh, this this is right in the uh, Guerneville is on the lower left corner of, of these uh, township and range lines this grid that I've got on here and the orange <coughs> lines so the green is forced or was forced in 1870 in the old surveys and the orange was um, mostly chemise, so chaparral. And if you look at where the orange is, the, then the Walbridge fire is in the background, kind of it's the red line. And you can see the Walbridge fire really followed uh, where the chaparral was 150 years ago. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of chaparral. You know, if you look back a few years, there was chaparral there even, you know, just before the fire, but not, not nearly as much. And 1870, I'd say is, you know, that's about as close to pre-European management as we're going to get for a, for a detailed look at what was happening on the landscape. And um, so, of course, Native people were, were intentionally burning at that time. And it, and it makes me think that, um, you know, we need to take this old picture of the landscape and, and start thinking, well, maybe you know, these are square miles that were forest, you know, less than a year ago. Um, 
maybe those some of those need to go back to chaparral with you know different kind of management uh, just recognizing that this is a fire prone area a fire maybe called a fire corridor and that um you know uh i think one of the difficulties now like people have mentioned is how do we how do we envision where we're going and this this is at least one one possibility i think is to start thinking about certain parts of our uh, current, current or recently current forests as, as maybe going into some other type of uh, life form, uh, some kind of uh, transition, um, you know, and, and managing for that um, as opposed to uh, trying to get the trees to come back. Maybe we need to think, okay, this should be, uh, chaparral is a better, a better thing here and it just needs to be managed as chaparral. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of ideas and discussion on that, but that's that's basically what I wanted to say. And I think this almost goes over to Fred's property. Uh, Fred will know better than I do. Um, but, yeah, yes. my, yeah, my property is um, right here at the north of the Rancho Sotiome line. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, I'm having a hard time seeing it at the moment, but anyway, it's. Um, I'll I'll send this map around. This is very preliminary, but um, I think it's given what we've just had um you know very relevant and uh, and i'll be tracing this forward in time to see how the forest changed over that 150 years um and then probably lo also looking at some uh, burn severity and and all sorts of different stuff um but anyway thanks for giving me the chance to share that and and i appreciate this group being here it's uh, um you know part of my hope is in people <laughs> right now that that we have a we have a stronger community and we have communication. We have a lot of good minds out there, and um, and willingness to to collaborate. So, thanks for being there. And I'll sign off with that. Thank you very much, Arthur. We really appreciate it. I mean, to to me here. Uh, follow. Uh, uh, Arthur, and then um, I believe I have, um, let me scroll down a little bit, uh, after Wendy, I have Shanti, if you, have, if you could be next. Hi, um, uh, my name is Wendy Smith, and I am uh, pres currently president of the Milo Baker chapter of the California Native Plant Society here in Sonoma County, and um, I just wanted to tell Fred that our hearts go out to you. Um, um, year ago, almost a year ago, Fred came out with Jason, um, Jason Wells from the RCD and walked our property, which, uh, which burned in the Kincaid fire. And I just want to tell, remind Fred that he looked around and said, oh yeah, this is all going to be fine. It's going to come back. And he was absolutely right. It's, it's just unbelievable how fast um, the, I mean, we have a couple of riparian areas. I think that probably helped. A lot of our stuff isn't gonna come back. I'm not gonna lie, but it is. Forest, um, be patient, hang in there, wait, wait to see, I mean, some of our trees we thought were dead and they're not. So, um, uh, so hang in there, Fred. And um, I appreciate Arthur's, Arthur's thoughts too, because we kind of went through uh, in a way all over again, our experience and Arthur must have been through that again too. Um, so anyway, I just want to say my two cents are that um, I think the, the strength of this group is focusing on forests and forest management, and we have a lot of science uh, represented here. And um, I think we really need to bring together all the experience that people have had um, scientifically and focus on how we can help landowners prepare. Um, and it's complicated. I mean, every single situation is different. Fred's situation is he has a working forest that he wants to be able to harvest and and yet like my husband and my our property we're just looking to uh to do the right ecological thing so i think there are differing um interests differing situations 
uh, differing intensity of fire, obviously. So um, I, I think to, to do a knee-jerk solution is um, what makes us all want to feel better, but we really need to be careful and, um, and do uh, fuel management in an ecologically sound way. Um, and I think uh, Ellie's touched on that and, and other folks as well. So I, I'm not, I don't mean to preach to the choir here. So that's, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lindy. Um, let me see. So uh, I have Ashanti and then Carleone, please. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see you. Um, yeah, it was a really big month. Um, our family was affected because we were, we live in Jenner and um, it was an intense time because the, the fires coincided with our son going back to school and distance learning. And so um, one thing to reflect on is this was kind of almost a triple whammy for some people who are evacuating the fire and then because of the pandemic, extra isolated or can't be with family and friends. And then trying to get kids to focus on school was, was a bit of a juggle. But um, the main takeaways that I have are that um, our community is stronger than ever. Uh, there are a lot of, um, like email listservs, like the Muniz Ranches group um, was very active and many residents did not leave. And so they were looking out for each other and monitoring the fire cameras, especially uh, the one on Pole Mountain. So that really kind of emphasized the need and uh, importance of such technology in these times. Um, there's also another group called Cas Hills Fire and Emergency. And that group really emerged as a really important conduit of information um, through all hours of the day and night, uh, people were listening to scanners and um, reporting back to the community. And, um, you know, now that we're kind of through the, the heart of the situation um, and kind of looking back, there are a lot of people, you know, trying to converge and, and interested in getting together. Um, I was a part of a meeting with um, Muniz Ranches, uh, Coast uh, Ridge Community Forest and Judy Rosales and um, Brooke from TWC and I. Um, talking about kind of what next and um, Damien from Pole Mountain Lookout is hearing a lot from um, the Casadero community about kind of what kind of planning is necessary and so I'm actually really excited to hear Carrie Leone speak next because I think that um, she's going to have a lot of good insights and information but but the, what I'm hearing mostly is that there's a, a need to get really strategic about identifying the most high priority areas for ridgetop uh, shaded fuel breaks because there's such a fuel load in the Western coastal hills of Sonoma County, and we have to get really strategic in a time of limited funding. Um, we can't be competing against each other, and we're all in this together. We've got to protect um, the entire region because of um, kind of the breadth um, of these fire events that um, we can't be isolated thinking about our, our own kind of road network and our own little community. We have to think big. and. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carol Leone and see what she has to say next. Before you do, I wanted to leave a little pause. I know Peter Hess was um, wanting to make a comment. Peter, uh, do you? Well, actually, I, I don't wanna speak out of order and Carol Leone, it sounds like what she has to say follows right away. So just let me know when, when I have an in. Okay. No hurry. Thank you, uh, Carol Leone. And then after Carol Leone is um, Steve Swain. Shanti sort of set me up, like, you know, like, like I'm going to have a lot of valuable input, and I'm, I'm feeling not that way. <laughs> sort of like completely overwhelmed by the world that we're living in. And one of my biggest personal struggles right now is with despair and feeling like it, that we're, we're doomed. There's nothing we can do. And so I'm spending a lot of time fighting with that and trying to find the pathway to, um, you know, moving forward with that while I am also writing millions of dollars worth of grants to try to fix it. So it's not like I'm giving up. But, um, Fred, I am so glad that I popped in in time to see your presentation because that's sort of where I've been going, is that it's like, you know, that that landscape was managed as well as any in the county. And the devastation was brutal. And 
that's what we're up against. I, I, I don't know what to say anymore. Many, many years ago, I was at a conference when I was first getting into this world, and um, I remember somebody presented at the conference and said, golly gee, the ecosystem of Northern California is going to look like Baja, California in X number of years. And I remember coming home and looking out my, you know, the backside of my property where I can see all the way from Sonoma Mountain to Snow Mountain in Mendocino and looking out over all of that forest and going, there's just no way. There's just no way that that can happen that fast. And then 2014 hit and Cobb burned. And I could see what happened to Cobb. And then it burned again. And now when I look at Cobb, what used to be a big black mountain covered with trees, it's now brown. It looks like Baja, California, right? And so, you know, I think that really what we're witnessing is that transition of ecotype to a completely different world. And the thing that I have come to understand by watching Cobb over the years is that this is not a slow process which I had always sort of thought, yeah, well, all those trees are just going to die, and then the type is going to change, and uh, it's going to be slow. It's not. It's fast. And this is, I think, what we're looking at. And Arthur, that was an interesting thought that it's like, yeah, those chaparral areas should be chaparral. You know, maybe. Um, but it's really very difficult. And kind of the way I see this overall is that um, we, Europeans, white people, whatever we want to call ourselves, came from Europe, moved into this landscape. Oh, those Native Americans and all their burning. Bad, bad, bad. And what we did is we built an entire world using withdrawals from the bank of 10,000 years of Native American burning. And then we lived in that world perfectly, happily, experts agree, everything's fine, for 100 years. And the bank balance went down to zero about 10 years ago, and now we're in negative balance for our wildlands. And all of our houses are in the middle of it, and I just don't know how to circle this up. And, you know, my approach is still we have to circle up the, 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 the homes through defensible space and structure hardening. Um, and I think more and more and more we have to really start looking at how fireproof can we make homes not just fire resistant? Um, we have to go way beyond where we've been going um, to move on. And I think that as we lose more and more houses, that's going to become more and more of the discussion as well as planning. Why do we think we can keep putting houses in these places that are destined to burn over and over and over again? And that's been a huge issue and it's going to continue to be a huge issue that I don't know how to get around. So, you know, rich top fuel break breaks, planning, you know, maybe the fuel breaks stop fires like this. We didn't even have any wind on this one. This was not a bad fire. And rich top fuel breaks in the wind, is that a reasonable, I mean, the good thing about it is at least those fuel breaks are planned, so at least that dozer work is getting done in an ecologically sensitive manner instead of just in the heat of the moment where, you know, the, so, you know, I don't know. I'm interested in engaging in discussion about what all everybody thinks about, you know, how do we circle this up? How do we, what should we be treating in these burned areas? How should, can we possibly use these burned areas and make that, use that opportunity to increase the resilience of the area in general? I don't know. So, Shawnee, I don't think that that fit into the category of, you know, wisdom. I think it fits into the category of despair and trauma. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Carly. I really appreciate your perspective on it all. It's, it all counts. Um, Steve Swain, and then I have somebody, plea court. I'm not sure if that's, uh, what's the name behind that? All right, you guys. Well, I'm going to echo a couple themes that have already been, and I'll try and keep it really short. So, um, you, you know, interestingly, the University of California has been under siege from Chinese and um, and Russian hackers, they say. Uh, and I've been have, struggling with that because I'm now required to use some pretty serious multi-factor authentication stuff. They've upgraded the multi-factor authentication to even more. So I got to get rid of my old cell phone and get rid of, got to pick up something that's um, even crazier uh, in terms of 
apps that you can do that are super secure and all this other stuff. And it just leaves me feeling a little bit more under siege because um, I'm not just under siege from physical threats. Now I'm under siege from, I can't even use my own university's networks without, you know, a Maxwell Smart Agent 99 kind of ridiculous series of um, stuff. Um, so, but th that's just one part of it. Another part of it is, um, I'm feeling a little bit isolated from my fellow Americans. And I know that's going to tell it sound like I'm talking about Trump. And there is an element to that with the whole, you know, big political picture and lack of funding for education and letting, you know, and foreign interference and everything. But even the folks right in my own neighborhood, people who are supposed to be my allies, and I'm, you know, I'm sure I'm seen as the enemy too, don't understand what science is. I'm having to argue with people about what science-based really means, and they're fucking firefighters I'm arguing with. And they're not stupid people, but they do not understand what science-based means. So, um, and to some extent, that starts making me feel like despair because I'm working against the people that are supposed to be on my side. And I'm sure they're feeling like I'm the not necessarily the good guy, too. And this gets back to some of the stuff. I mean, Ellie and Carleone and I were hopefully going to be working on a burn of junipers because I'd love to be able to have something that brings us a little together and allows us all to agree that these are real things. But of course, the fires got in the way. How many firefighters are there to spare while I set fire to Ellie's juniper bushes while they're working? There's, yeah, that's nuts. Nobody's... Uh, Anyway, so I'm feeling a little, um, <sighs> anyway, uh, so enough focusing on what's wrong. Um, what's right? What's right is I feel like this group um, was set up to do outreach to forest landowners. I'm not seeing us do a ton of that. I'm hearing some talk of that happening among uh, some people just on the chat uh, this morning. I know that Morgan Doran has held a f f workshop for all the ranchers over in um, uh, Napa Yolo area. And I'm thinking we, uh, I'm guessing there's a lot of people out there with homes that have been burning and they have no idea what the resources are and those kinds of things. And I'm thinking a virtual re workshop in the near future is probably a really good idea. Um, I would love to work with anybody who wants to do that. But that's sort of my, what I think is our mission. And I think, um, you know, I've saw one or two people saying we should get people with really radically different viewpoints and bring them into the same room. And I'm all for that. I don't think you're going to have a problem with getting people with radically different viewpoints in the room. I think the biggest problem is going to be building consensus. Again, back to the siege thing. But folks, but I got people in my neighborhood who are all getting pissed off because they're going to put in a cell tower across the road from us. And it's like, seriously, that Sonoma County is burning and you're worried about fake science. I mean, fake news, you know, um, Anyway, uh, I don't think you're going to have a hard time getting the people with diverse viewpoints into a room. I think the, the challenge is going to be finding the common ground where we can move forward and not be worried about cell towers um, and focusing on the stuff that's actually a risk to um, life and home. And I apologize to anybody. No, I don't. I don't apologize to anybody who's worried about 5G because it's just not an issue. Um, uh, enough said. All right. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I really appreciate your perspective. It's, it's like I said, it's just, it all counts. You know, there's a lot of uh, raw emotions everywhere. And we're going through some very difficult times for us all to process it. I think this is certainly a value for our, our group. Um, I have uh, plea court. Could you um, take next? Uh, and then I have uh, Earl after that. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, my name is Peter LaCourt. This is my first experience here with this group. Uh, I was hooked up via Jason Mills from the Sonoma Ecology Center because he's doing a project for me in the forest I manage, which is the Pacific Union College demonstration and experimental forest here in Angwin, which is actually in Napa County, just in the hills above St. Helena. Uh, I was born and raised here in Angwin. I've got undergraduate degrees in forestry and environmental studies, and I also have a master's degree in GIS. Uh, again, I'm a forest manager of the PUC Forest here in Angwin. I'm also a member of the Angwin Fire Safe Council, and I'm a board member of the Napa Communities Firewise Foundation. 
So fire is very much a big part of my world and I'm really honored to be a part of this group and this discussion this morning. Uh, a couple of just quick thoughts that I had from the recent experiences of the fires. Uh, this was actually my first mandatory evacuation from Angwin in our modern uh, era of fires in the last 10 years. One of the things I learned, you've all heard the expression, the shoemaker's kids have any shoes. Like I worry so much about pre-fire and getting my community treated. I didn't focus enough on myself. So when the time actually for an evacuation came, I found myself a little underprepared because again, I'm thinking about everybody else and I don't concentrate on myself enough. So all of us who are operating here at the 20,000 foot level, we need to also make sure that our homes and our families and our communities are just as safe as the larger landscape we're hoping to treat. Uh, kind of the next point that I was king is that, you know, essentially, we have 33 million acres of forest here in California, and with large swaths of land experiencing stand-replacing events every year, we really need to ramp up our efforts to help treat our forests, restore their native fire ecology on just a large level across the state in a somewhat World War II-esque fashion. Because our time is really kind of running out as we're experiencing large fires every year if we want to continue to have intact forests with logical integrity that maintain some kind of connection to each other. You know, we put so much funding into fire suppression, literally billions of dollars are put into pressing these fires. And yet, you know, the, the bill that was passed SB 901 by State Senator Bill Dodd two or three years ago that allocated $1 billion over five years into the CAL FIRE CCI grants, you know, we'll spend so much more money on one fire compared to what the whole state is spending for five years for all 50 some odd counties of the state. And that's really kind of a backwards model that I think needs to be reversed. It's so hard for us to get these CAL FIRE grants that we're talking about, you know, the smaller fire prevention grants and the large forest health grants. And we're starting to see, you know, communities kind of competing with each other. And I'm hearing that in this call. And we really kind of need to change this model and figure out a better way to come up with funding for all of the forest land that we have that is affected by this problem. Uh, something I see here in my town of Angwin is a large amount of the forested land that is affecting the safety of my town is owned by private landowners. So we really need a good way to help coordinate private landowners and be assisting them bringing resources onto their lands. Personally, the way I feel about it is, you know, the state and federal governments have been suppressing fire for the last hundred years, which is understandable why that's happening. The reality is that now the private landowner, one of which I represent, is now somewhat stuck of seeing the bill of the last hundred years of fire suppression activities that have happened. So I really think that the state and the federal government do have somewhat of uh, an incentive and an obligation to help with private landowners. And I think that this is really a place where fire safe councils and the firewise community is really key to this problem because we've got, you know, larger government resources that are becoming available and we need to hook them up with private landers. And if we've got somebody from the government knocking on a private landowner's door saying, hey, let me treat your land, we're going to get a little bit more skepticism. But if you're a private landowner and Steve from up the street says, hey, I'm part of this organization called Firewise and we can help bring resources onto your land and help you protect your home and your community, I think that's going to open up a little more willingness on behalf of private landowners to work with, you know, state and government agencies. That being said, as I mentioned earlier, there's really not enough funding coming in in the form of these grants. And a big problem that we're facing is how do we treat these large landscape levels of forest with the small amounting of funding that we have coming in from you know, various resources, being partly the NRCS, who I'd like to give a big shout out to, and they're great at working with private landowners, as well as you know, these CAL FIRE grants and whatnot. Personally, what I'd like to see in Napa County, I think that our communities need to really figure out a way to help protect themselves. Because again, I'm skeptical that we can rely on state and federal governments for everything we need. I personally feel that we need some kind of bond initiative or something on county levels for our counties to be generating the funding that they need to be able to treat the forested land within their counties. I think the county is a really good level for us to be focusing on this problem at. And bottom line is that we citizens are losing our homes and our wildlands on a regular basis here every summer. So I do think that it's somewhat on us to help contribute to help mitigate this problem that we're all facing together. 
these are some of the issues that I face in my town of Angwin, and I'm thinking about how about I can go about treating these lands. I manage about a thousand acres of forested land, which is quite a mouthful in and of itself, and I'm working on treating about five or six thousand acres that completely surround my town. And I'm a little overwhelmed, but I'm really uh, encouraged by the continuing momentum we're seeing behind the importance of fire mitigation, especially on an ecological level. And I appreciate that emphasis of this group. And yeah, those are kind of my thoughts on what I'm seeing here in Angwin. And it's been a pleasure to present to you today. Peter, thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation and hopefully, hopefully we'll see in other meetings as well. It's a, you're a valuable asset. Um, Peter Hess, I'll actually be presenting on share? the next one. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. thanks, Peter. Sure. Uh, Peter Hess, did you say you wanted to contribute something? Um, well, only if everybody else has already spoken. I'm not sure what order you're doing this in. Um, it's a random, uh, uh, bifurcated and trifurcated, but otherwise uh, pretty random. Now, Peter, okay. let me get um, our last speaker would be Brooke, uh, and then we can open it up to a larger dialogue. Sure. Uh, is that the new way? That's fine. Okay, so uh, Brooke, why don't you take off? <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Um, I'm using my watershed background for my Santa Rosa JC watershed class that I, I teach. That's why I have the background there. So um, I really appreciate uh, the discussion that I've heard. I really appreciate this group. Um, it's really uh, the group and everyone involved is what connects me to really the rest of the county in terms of what's going on in terms of, uh, you know, fuel, uh, fire breaks and uh, fire planning. Uh, so I just want to say I really appreciate you guys. And um, I want to echo what Peter was just talking about of uh, not necessarily uh, you know, we can't rely on the federal government or even the state government. Uh, to really help us out here. Uh, we need to get together as a community, um, as a countywide community. And, uh, uh, you know, one thing I want to say is uh, I'm not necessarily surprised at uh, the, the fires that we've seen recently. We, we've been talking about uh, an occurrence like this happening. Um, but, um, you know, what I am surprised is I thought that we as a county would be able to um, do some more comprehensive and strategic uh, planning county wise uh, so that uh, we had a, a document that could tie us together in terms of different projects, but then also that would help the county bring in more funding uh, for this type of work. Um, and so it's hard to keep up on everything uh, in terms of um, fire planning and emergency response. Uh, but I know I've been on some uh, field trips with uh, Linda Hopkins and James Gore and some of you folks as well. We've had um, some conferences with the Office of Resiliency and Recovery. Um, there seems like there's a lot going on, but there's really nothing or, or one entity at the county level that's tying us all together. And I think that's essential if we are actually going to, to do anything worthwhile out on the landscape. Um, so I think that's imperative. Um, I've had a hard time keeping up with everything that's going on with this group, as I'm sure everyone's uh, lives have been really busy with COVID. Um, I'm not sure if we had anyone from Office of Recovery and Resiliency uh, give a presentation, um, but I think we should have someone from that office perhaps even sitting at these meetings, just because we are doing so much and they should hear about what we're doing really on a monthly basis. We need something to, to tie us all together. Comprehensive planning, a clearinghouse website where a lot of this information could be found, uh, where projects that are, have been done are, have been mapped and people can see where those projects are, see how maybe they can link these projects up together on adjacent properties, especially if it's a priority area. Um, we've talked about shaded fuel breaks, and uh, you know we know that uh, that was definitely not the answer. That it's multifaceted. Um, I think with shaded fuel breaks, that was just like our first step. We're we're, we're trying to move forward in some way and understand how we can alter uh, the fuel loads out there. But I do think we need to really 
take that concept of fuel break and, and tree thinning and reduction of trees per acre to a much larger scale. Uh, the shaded fuel breaks is an area that we can kind of focus our energy, but really uh, in terms of Jenner Headlands, the long-term plan was to put in our shaded fuel breaks and then we do restoration forestry on the remaining forested acres um, where we're reducing the trees per acre. Uh, we're reducing that fuel load in some instances. Um, and so it needs to happen at a much uh, larger scale, um, well beyond these shaded fuel breaks. Uh, I, I did want to say one thing about the shaded fuel breaks is that, you know, we understood the shaded fuel breaks were not going to be stopping these fires. Um, uh, a lot of times what we say in tandem with the shaded fuel breaks put on, on ridge lines is that it's really a place where Cal Fire can go in uh, an area of reduced fuel load and fight that fire directly. If it happens that that shaded fuel break is strategically located in terms of how that fire is moving, uh, which, you know, uh, weather circumstances, fires are going to be moving in different directions. You won't really know until these circumstances present themselves. Um, and, and we knew that the facility of the shaded fuel breaks was to to, so that Cal Fire could uh, have a safe place to, to try to fight some of these fires. And even though I knew that, um, it really hit home when I was listening to the scanner. You know, when those lightning strikes happened and the fires were going, I was on the scanner 24-7. Uh, and I'm hearing Marshall, and he's directing his crews out into these extremely remote locations. Uh, you know, talking to dozer operators, uh, you know, they're calling up saying, where do I go? Do I take, you know, do I take a right here? And they're like, yeah, take a right at the flagging. And I'm thinking, you know, this is at nighttime. There's got to be a lot of smoke, a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos. Um, and he's directing his crews into these deep remote areas um, where if there were had some shaded fuel breaks, at least it's an area of reduced fuel load. Uh, it's an area where perhaps they could fight the fire instead of backfire or, or fight that directly. And it, for some reason, it, it, it finally hit home that, you know, he's putting his crew's lives on the line by sending them out into these remote locations. They're taking turns at flagging. They could definitely be taking a wrong turn and get in some serious trouble. Uh, we hear about this happening all the time. And so, uh, you know, the utility of those shaded fuel breaks is so that Cal Fire can get into these remote locations and, and hopefully fight those fires if, if the circumstances present, the, uh, present themselves. Um, so, so those are some of my thoughts. Um, I, like Shanti said, we recently met with some folks uh, from the Coast Ridge uh, Community Forest, uh, Judy Rosales, Craig Hayes from Muniz Ranches, uh, finally realizing that um, we really need to get together, at least in our just our, our, our Coast Ridge area, and we need to start mapping where our projects are. We need to start identifying those ridge lines. We need to start uh, figuring out uh, and prioritizing and planning on our own because we're not getting that grant fund from from from, from Cal Fire. It's it's going in other uh, directions. So we're doing what we can to cobble uh, really an ad hoc planning, um, at least put some things on a map um, that perhaps if we do get funding, you know, we could move forward in the future on this. Uh, but the realization is uh, we need to do this ourselves and we need to figure out a way that we can bring us all together, tie our efforts together, comprehensive planning that will hopefully also bring in some funding um, uh, at, at the countywide level. So. Those are some of my thoughts. I appreciate everyone, uh, all the, the thoughts that you guys have um, provided, and I think it's a really useful discussion we're having today. Can I jump in real quick? Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brooke. And um, I forgot two uh, very critical uh, speakers, uh, Adriana and myself, and then we'll get to Peter Hess's question. So Adriana, do you want to go next, please? Kelly, I heard you say you wanted to say something. Yeah, I had a first. Brooke, if I can jump in just for a second before you. Um, a lot of the wildfire planning and activity at the county level right now is happening um, at Permit Sonoma, for whom I work. Um, so we're 
diving in on um, a bunch of grants that tie up. Um, the one I'm literally working on as we speak um, is tying in fuel breaks near communities as well as structure hardening and defensible space um, to bring those three concepts together because um, I think that we can't do it with any of them alone. I think we have to look at all of them. And um, on the larger scale, um, and I'm also a resident of the, I live between Fort Ross and Casadero. So, and I'm a firefighter for the local fire department here. So I, I, I got all of that. Um, but I'll tell you one of the things that, oh, and one more thing on the permit Sonoma note that I, this is super important is we have funding in place to update the Sonoma County CWPP, which um, was written um, by Fire Safe Sonoma um, in 2016 with almost no money. And so we now have um, funds in place to get the mapping, modeling, and um, a much more sophisticated CWPP out there. Um, we just floated out the RFP. I think tomorrow it's going out. So we'll have a contractor on board. We already have our mapping and modeling going. What we're going to need for that is for everybody to participate in these projects and to have these conversations um, about how do we prioritize these projects on a countywide scale. So the wheels are turning for that countywide CWPP. Um, there are also a lot of wheels turning for local CWPPs, but right now I would really like to get a lot of attention and focus from everybody who's on this call and all of your friends on, you know, how do we really, really get this circled up for the countywide CWPP. Um, also, one of the things that I think bears thought and discussion is um, perhaps it's time that we start looking at the potential within the county of creating a wildfire protection district, um, which will be funded however we fund it. It's going to be an extensive proposal. But that would bring a lot more flexibility to how we can do what we're trying to do. Marin just got one going. Um, Marin has certain advantages that we don't have as much up here, such as lots and lots of money. But um, I think that that is a really good place to go, start looking at how can we fund fuels crews who can go out and do a bunch of this work and um, really have an organization that pulls together the fire safe councils, the agencies, the water agency, everybody who has a dog in the fight of wildland fire. So thank you for that, Adriana. Thanks, Carolina. Thanks, Carolina. Um, yeah, I'll just be brief. I, I think, I mean, everything that I've heard so far has been really resonates with me a lot. Um, and I just, I guess I want to say that some of the experiences that I've had over the last couple of years that have been impressive for me or, in, um, in, you know, given me some insight is just the, um, I think the great need for out of the box thinking is what I keep concluding on since I, I know we've been trying to do grant writing and kind of go through the normal avenues to get work done, but the, the scale of the, um, you know, disturbance that we're having from these wildfires is so much greater than, um, it's just really a regional level than um, a local level. And so um, I've been thinking about how do we do these kind of larger scale treat treatments. And I love Peter's idea of, um, you know, not waiting for state or federal assistance and, and kind of, thinking more outside of the box by funding a, a bond measure here at the county level. Um, and also I think um, getting really smart about how to use, how, how to recruit and use volunteers. And I've been really inspired by the Good Fire Alliance that's doing prescribed burning with volunteer crews and really amazing leadership. Um, and just thinking more about how we can get on that level. I think not just prescribed fire, but we could be helping more with communities to do um, that collaborative grazing that, that was mentioned. I think um, Penny brought that up as something that on her wish list. Um, and, um, you know, volunteer based thinning, I think there is some amount of thinning that we can be doing um, around homes and structures uh, by hand um, and with volunteers. Um, I know that there's like way more acreage than we can we can really chip away at with volunteers in that way. But I, I think um, getting to it, getting started and, and just really kind of 
putting ourselves on the job is, is a good place to start and that more creativity and solutions will follow from there. Um, because yeah, I think what we've been doing has been, has been good, um, but uh, we need to ramp up even more. And um, yeah, I, wanna, I want to empower our Fire Safe Council to be leading the, the way on that and for all of us to um, be supporting that kind of model of, of homegrown change. So I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks Adriana. And I just wanna uh, toss out a, a huge shout out for you and the work that you do for our group and making sure that we stay on task and uh, address these critical questions about what direction we need to take our organization. Um, I think uh, the big lessons learned uh, for me over 15 years with the forest working group, that's pretty stunning. But um, one of the things that in the last three years that I've recognized is that we do have a critical role to be bringing so many different people and so many different interests together. And we might not all see uh, eye to eye on all these different issues, but we share a common interest in doing the right thing for our resources. And so we represent such different uh, interests and in agencies and uh, the types of uh, communities that we're coming from, but we, we are definitely bonded uh, by the, our shared experiences uh, from calamity to the ecstasy of seeing great, great forest management, resource management on the ground. Um, the thing that I really uh, want to recognize is that we are not working in a vacuum, that all of us are working on, on scales of different types. And so uh, as a working group, I think we've really been able to hone in on the, the scale that seems appropriate to me. And, and um, with all of us doing our different uh, bits to it. We're, we're recognizing that we have a real role to play as a working group working at this scale. I totally respect what Taking Action wants to do and working on a larger scale. Uh, the state and federal levels, they have their concerns, but we've been able to kind of hone in and work at this, the scale of the counties, the scale of the watersheds, and the scale of the community work, uh, forests out there, such as Mark West and Guala and Coast Ridge, all those are great examples for us to be able to leverage and continue to replicate uh, across the county and share those experiences, share that expertise. I agree there's always a funding issue, but I always uh, get concerned about going too, bit, too much, too much uh, larger than we can, can handle and then uh, having too great of expectations of what we as a working group can do. All of our organizations can do great work and it's much better when we start to catalyze off of each other. But um, I really think we have to be careful about uh, what our true role is going to be as a working group and make sure that um, we don't uh, overinflate what we're capable of doing with only Adriana as our, our, uh, our quasi paid uh, person on this uh, on this phone call. So I do appreciate that. One of the things I also think is important is that um, we look at those uh, tribal inputs that we have uh, not had much experience uh, on, as an organization, as a working group to incorporate uh, tribal entities. I think that would be one thing that we could uh, stretch ourselves to do. Um, and always to depend on what is the best science I think uh, if nothing uh, else, the district has been able to provide uh, great mapping resources. We're doing some really uh, very fascinating things on uh, lands that we are uh, managing, such as Saddle and, and Calabasas. I really hope that we can continue to do that and serve as an example of things we can do on the land management front. So uh, your input on that is valuable. The Vital Lands Initiative, the type of feedback we get from you all, it's been super, super helpful. So those are probably the things I really appreciate most about what the working group does. And I think I just, uh, again, just a really a heartfelt thanks to all of you guys who have participated in the working group over time and, and what you guys are doing in your own communities. That's absolutely huge. And so thank you for that. And thanks for letting me ramble as a facilitator. 
So now is a pretty exciting time about where do we go from here? So Adriana, do you have some suggestions on how you'd like to handle this? I'm sure, yeah, we just have 18 minutes left. I feel like our meetings are never long enough. <laughs> um, but I think maybe what we should do is just um, kind of talk about, just skim off the top some of the top lessons that we've learned um, or, or um, you know, maybe it would be good to, to really, like you said, um, him bring it back to the realistic work that we can do as a forest working group. Um, I think actually that would be the best use of our time. I'm sure everyone sort of flagged things as they were listening. What are the ones that resonate with them the most? But let's really put our minds on what, where does this leave the work of the working group? Because um, that'll help me moving forward, help, help our, our, our work as a working group. And um, um, I, I'll start us off by saying I heard, I think it was Steve, Swain um, say, you know, a big part of our charge as a working group is land and our outreach and education. And we have not been doing a whole lot of that. I will put the blame right on me. Um, COVID has been a crazy time. <laughs> um, but I think we could be doing more, um, uh, uh, more workshops and definitely bringing more relevant speakers to bear. We've, we've been, um, we've had great speakers in the past and I think we just need to keep the speaker series going. Um, Another, another thought beyond just like um, ongoing speakers is um, something that Dee and I have been noodling around on, which is kind of having a virtual um, conference of some kind where we have multiple speakers come. So we would maybe like replace one of our meetings with just a session, a longer session with, with a bunch of speakers just to kind of get, get some of the knowledge out there. Um, so I see those and a couple other forms of education as being a good priority for, for us. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll put it on to the next person who has a, a takeaway from what we just heard and how we can would connect it with our work here. Would this be the time for me to uh, speak? Yes, Adrian? exactly. I was gonna go to Peter first and then uh, Ann Krila. Okay, um, thank you. Just tremendous ideas and um, I'm very heartened. I wanna just, put mine into three headings. First is attitudes. Um, in Lake County and possibly in Sonoma County, um, uh, our burning groups have encountered very odd ideas from urban transplants to the country. And the year after the fire, um, when I began my attempt to capitalize on the fact that, like Fred, my entire property had been burned uh, and I wanted to help the trees grow and stop the brush from coming back. Um, a woman from Harbin Hot Springs, which is a sort of a hippie-ish place, told me that she objected to what I was doing and the best way to stop brush from growing was to dance naked in the moonlight and offer herbal prayers that it wouldn't regrow. And I told her that I respectfully disagreed with her approach. Then another person from Harbin as recently as last January, when I was in the middle of my, uh, I did a huge blitz of 230 prescribed burns on my property between December and, and April because I could with COVID and because I needed to. This woman threatened me and other burners with a class action lawsuit because I was affecting her asthma. And while I acknowledge that there are, there are issues with asthma, I also pointed out that whatever we burn in February cannot burn in October. So this is a whole complex of issues that I know that we in all counties face, and I'm not sure how to address this. The second set of ideas comes, uh, refers to personal circumstances. Cobb is an area, as I mentioned, where lots of retirees from the Bay Area live on a half, half acre lot or less. Um, I'm one of the few people there who, has, who both has a PhD and has been wielding a chainsaw since I was 10 years old in 1966. I recognize that many people have never lit a match, never, t never started a fire, never run a chainsaw. And so one of the things we're trying to do as a community and this relates to uh, the last two speakers, and I think maybe Adriana, something you said. We're trying to match up things like students who need to do service hours with elderly people who need service work. So, so we're getting um, cooperative to try to get the, the clearing done. Um, another brand new venture, I was just asked to help um, write up a draw up a curriculum for the Palmo of Lake County to to bring good burning back to the land which of course is part of their heritage and so I'm very excited 
that the indigenous community are just as excited as the rest of us are, are about the Good Fire Alliance. The third category of statements has to do with actions that we can take after our house burned. And it's, it's a multifamily house owned by 11 people. So um, fortunately, nobody got shot during the negotiations about how to rebuild the house. But we all agreed that we wanted hardy plank walls and a steel roof. And um, the wisdom of this choice was illustrated to me two weeks ago when my son, Michael, the firefighter, was doing structure protection in Berryessa Estates. And he told me, he said, Dad, we were, we were spraying water on this house and 100 feet down the hillside, there was a blow up in a patch of brush. And as we were watering the house, we watched the vinyl siding melt right off the house. Now they were able to save the house, but boy, am I glad we went with hardy plank instead of vinyl siding. So actions that um, several of you have mentioned, and um, I think Carol, uh, Carly and you talked about um, um, appropriate rebuilding, rebuilding fire hardened structures as, as did many other people. So I always talk about fire hardened structures and then use of, of controlled burning and um, to, to, tr to try to turn our acreage into something that is long-term sustainable. And that's obviously going to be a huge subject for the rest of us, for all of us as we go forward. So, um, uh, so, so anyway, and oh, and one final point about actions. I did do ground burning before the Valley Fire and the one part of our woods that survived was where I had burned every scrap of vegetation on the forest floor. We had about five or six acres of beautiful timber survive. I wish I had gotten to more of it, but I didn't. So that would be my testimonial to how uh, ground burning really does make a difference. Anyway, that's a lot <laughs> in a short amount of time. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Anne, would you like to share something? Sure. Um, so first, so many of the things that have been said on this call really resonate with me. Um, I wanted to, uh, one, mention that, um, you know, Adriana and I have talked in the past about doing some sort of um, outreach video um, related to landowner um, experiences, and I'm not sure where that ended up. I think, Adriana, you uh, were able to take that forward, maybe. It sounds like Penny's experience at Monin's Real getting some funding to through NRCS could be a really great story to tell and post on our various uh, websites. Um, in addition, uh, we as Cinema Water were able to help sponsor a video uh, that Napa RCD uh, instigated, and it's about cooperative burning and um, our Good Fire Alliance and Audubon Canyon Ranch were a big part of that. Um, that is now done, and it's about to get released, and it can be used for outre outreach um, through social media or whatever, uh, various websites to um, talk about prescribed burning and how what the benefits are and um, maybe make it a little less scary. Um, and uh, so that's coming out soon. There's a press release um, drafted and just kind of being played with now. Um, so we were able to sponsor that um, through our kind of sponsorship process. And so I'm wondering if, um, if there could be a video or something created uh, to help with outreach to you know, share stories like Penny's, Monin's Rills, um, you know, maybe we could help support in that way. Um, and then I wanted to also say that I've been part of the uh, WORT process for Wallbridge and I'm on the Watershed Task Force. And so I may be able to share updates as they happen um, in terms of data availability, et cetera. Um, I think that now there are some uh, mapping products that are public um, that I could probably share with the group um, from USGS regarding burn severity and potential for um, landslides, et cetera. So um, I'm poking around on the map right now. And um, so those might be useful also. Um, and let's see, I guess, um, anything else? Oh, the, um, let's see. Oh, regarding air quality, um, I know that there is an effort now to look at air quality impacts from uh, prescribed burns. So at the Cooley Ranch fire, we had a uh, an air quality monitor, a whole weather station kind of thing 
monitoring air quality uh, as part of a larger effort to collect data um, to compare wildfire air quality impacts versus prescribed burns. And as we all know, those impacts are much less for prescribed burn than a, than a wildfire where you're burning the, the crown and the canopy. So um, anyway, if I ever, um, I'm not totally plugged in on that effort, but I'll see if I can uh, find out more about that. And once there's information out there, it would be good to publicize it because I think that would be helpful, at least for people who are willing to hear it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Anne. I appreciate your comments. Uh, anybody else like to share anything? Yeah, um, we've been talking a lot about um, maybe putting together a workshop. And I think um, if nobody objects, I'd like to work as either point or something like that on a workshop. Uh, I'm thinking probably virtual. I'm thinking it would probably be something where we just uh, reach out to especially the affected areas, but anybody would be welcome to attend. And we would do something along the lines of, First, my, my, I imagine we would need to sit down and brainstorm what are the things that the people who are just going to have houses burned, and we have some people here who know a lot about that, it sounds like, um, what are the resources they're going to need? Um, and then, you know, can we hook them up? And maybe we want to work with the Sonoma County Offices of Emergency Services and those kinds of folks and, and, uh, and see if we could coordinate something along those lines. Maybe that's not the way we go. I don't know, but that's just my first thought. That's what Morgan Doran did with the ranchers and basically introduced the ranchers to all kinds of potential funding opportunities to help them recover and, and at least plans to help them make up a, um, a guide. So. I, if anybody's interested in that, you can email me at svswain at ucanr.edu and maybe I'll even have access to my email someday. You know, that'd be good. Hey Steve, thanks for that. Um, there are a lot of resources that are getting shared around right now about recovery, not just, um, I mean, about both how do you return to your property once it's been burned and then also how do you heal the land um, from NRCS and there, there are also, you know, resources that were developed by the RCD from the last um, couple of fires. So we have materials to work with and we have partners to call on. So yes, I, I'd love to work with you on that. Okay, it looks like you and Fred. Anybody else wants to? SV Swain at ucanr.edu. Yeah, go ahead, Fred, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, speaking of UC, um, I've been talking to Kim Ingram who would like, uh, who has the capacity to do one of the forest workshops that UC puts on. Yay. In Sonoma. And uh, January, February is a time we can do it. If there's consensus amongst the group, I'd like to just move forward with that and use that as, if you will, a, a, an organizing platform as well as the UC thing so that we can keep moving into our next phases. And, you know, it, we can reach 30 people in their class, but perhaps that can go exponentially or at least multiplicatively into a larger <laughs> group as we move forward. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea, Fred and yeah. Adriana. So thank you both for that. I look forward to working with you guys on this in any way, shape, or form it ends up being. And Carly on too. Okay. We have time. I started working. Okay, I did the, I'm taking the class right now with the uh, UCNR. ANR, um, and it's it's really, really, really been interesting. And I've uh, been plugging that, that I, this is just kind of like the preliminary homework for us to get something in Sonoma County and so that's really exciting to see. It's a great, it's a great workshop for landowners that will really work well for, for our county. And we can dial into the specific issues that are, are threatening our area. Um, Ellie, I think you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, as somebody who's you know basically really new to somewhat this subject and also to this group, um, can you all tell me, do you feel like there's um, enough education about when when thinning happens that maybe go after invasive species for the latter fuels um, before native plants and also that you know what our team has been doing and we've reached about 300 landowners is is helping them think about specifically what to plant and aiming more towards natives and aiming more towards plant communities 
And, um, and then the third, though, there's, there's different groups, like then there's the people who go out and do assessments, either, either defensible space, usually defensible space, are they being trained in, in those specific areas that I just mentioned? I mean, this is a, we wrote a grant to CAL FIRE with Care Leone and Roberta last fall. Um, and, and then also landscape designers and nurseries and contractors to, to try to reach all of those groups about how to take care of their landscapes and how to put things into their landscapes. And I just want to put a plug in for more education about that in case it's not there. And like I said, I'm new. And do other people feel like there's enough of that in, in the trainings, that the multiplicity of trainings that we're doing? I'll pipe in on that one. I think you're right that, you know, um, it, we need education in that area. We've spent a lot of time, as you're aware, haggling over some of the details of this. And basically, um, yeah, I think we should be telling, giving people ideas of what, what to plant and what not to plant and some of the most, and basically it comes down to maintenance, you know, um, putting in, having anything that's invasive is going to be a maintenance nightmare. So, um, but yeah, well, we can, I think that should be a focus on what we do for outreach to, um, to people who, all interested parties from homeowners to to some of the, the, it gets a little more complicated when you're talking to fire departments and inspections, especially since some cities are insisting on having plant lists, uh, like you can't have this, and then they're having their inspectors go out and and uh, and look for those plants in particular, and then tell people you have to remove these if if they find them. Um, that sort of goes against the science that's out there, but. That's right. only a temporary thing, too. I mean, um, so some some laws are in already been put in place, and they're contradicting the science. And I think we're going to have to work around those in a politically expedient manner because we don't want to spend a whole bunch of our time getting into spitting contests with fire departments. Um, well, and I also just just want to mention because I just got an email from somebody who's been who's being funded to do assessments, defensible space assessments, and he just sent me an email asking that, you know, he had a whole list, plant lists and, and other things that many of the, which are invasive and, and many of which are actually fire prone. So that, I mean, to me, that's a, that's a big subject. And I'm, I'm hoping that this work group can be involved with helping with solutions. And um, I'm, I'm can there. I, can I um, jump in just a minute to, since we're almost out of time and thinking about our next steps. And I just wanted to put a plug into the idea of a virtual um, conference that um, we've come up with so many great ideas. My head's a little bit full of everything that we've said these two hours. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe a next step would be to call through, I, I'm not sure if we get to uh, keep the chat record or not, yeah. but to call through all of the big, like great themes that a conference could be, could include and maybe build on that some more as a next step. So I heard people talk about workshops, but I didn't, I went, didn't want to lose that idea of a more inclusive conference that could have maybe different themes to it. Great. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, uh, Jean, you have your hand up and then that's, I think we need to wrap this up. Uh, but uh, Okay, Jean, thank you really quickly. <clears throat> In Mendocino County, we have the Mendocino County Fire Safe Council that's overarching. And so we're getting a lot of uh, grant money from Cal Fire <clears throat> that's being used in all 15 fire safe councils throughout the county for chipper days, for veg management on roads. And, <clears throat> and so it, it's really good to have um, one place where the money's coming in that it can then be divvied out. And I'm, I'm thinking of as far as all the different conferences and workshops we're talking about, um, it might be helpful to look at what organization can kind of be the pivotal point in putting this together <clears throat> and then uh, um, workshops sprout out of that. So just an idea to not be overlapping. Um, Fred, thank you for your uh, incredible presentation that was uh, upsetting and also uh, uh, it's good to learn and know and um, I know other Sierra Club people who have been doing salvage including uh, Peter who's on the call and so maybe the issue is more with bigger industrial salvaging where they're just tearing the land apart but 
there is definitely, there are a lot of positive benefits to salvage. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, this has been a really great two hours. I mean, talk about jam packed. Uh, Adriana, thanks. Uh, I'll be amazed at uh, getting the uh, notes back and, and seeing a summary of everything that was shared. Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a lot of notes here and we recorded it, which is great for people to watch later, but I can't help myself with note taking for some reason. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, as a as like a um, closing for us, I had a thought I just wanted to ask about um, our October meeting. I heard um, Peter LaCourt say that he intends on um, giving his presentation. He had to reschedule from last month. And I think I heard Peter say that he wants to give his presentation next month. Is that right? Or did I miss hear you? Uh, that is correct. I would love to be involved next month. Okay. So um, thinking about our agenda for next month, I think it would be great to get his presentation on the thinning work that they've done in the Anguin area. Um, but for the meat of our conversation, I think it would be great if we could focus, we could, we could just put a pin in our conversation that we had today and then come back to it next month talking about more solutions and projects that the working group can take on because um, I think we could do, we could spend some good time designing um, some of these things that we've been talking about. Does that sound good to people? You can give me like a thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, I'm seeing mostly <laughs> thumbs up, that's good. Fantastic, folks. Well, thank you all for participating today. It was, a, I think, a really great session. Uh, we'll try to get a, a summary of those notes and share them with the people who weren't able to participate today. Um, but we really appreciate your input today. That was fantastic. Be safe, uh, wear a mask, wash your hands, and take care. Okay, folks? Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everybody. Stay well. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. A real pleasure.